Between the years of 2014 and 2015 in Barking in London, the bodies of four young men were discovered. They died from an overdose and were all found with no mobile phone and a bottle of GHB in their pockets. Three of the four men were even found against the same wall in the same churchyard. Despite the striking similarities between the deaths, the police didn't consider them suspicious and even refused to consider that they were connected. Despite pleas from the families and friends of the victims, this is what happens when a twisted sexual predator has unlimited access to a litany of victims at his fingertips. This is the case of Stephen Port, the sadistic murderer who would become known as the Grinder Killer. No! case in documentaries before but I wanted to do a deep dive on it because it's one of those cases that you find equally horrifying as you do frustrating because to all intents and purposes it shows fundamental failings in the policing involved in the investigations of these young men's deaths and it also highlights I would suggest some biases and beliefs and stereotypes that are levied against a community that when done so in such circumstances can mean that failings occur. So it's a classic tale of lessons learned in the most horrific as ways. Also, you'll note I'm wearing my new merch. I do love it. We've collaborated with a young designer called Joe and I really, really like this particular colour. I also like the style of this. So if you want to get hold of one, please do look on my website. It will be available. To all of you who support me on Patreon and YouTube membership, thank you so much. Can't make this without you. I am doing more videos. So hopefully you will feel that you are supporting me for the right reasons. Today's case is one of those that will leave you disturbed, but also, as I said, annoyed. And it's so powerfully important that when mistakes are made, we actually get to point them out and also to consider what can change to prevent these kind of things happening again. Because there is nothing as catastrophic as instrumental failings that essentially lead potentially to future killings. That's why covering cases like this is so important. So let's look at Stephen Port. So in 1975, Stephen Port was born in Southend-on-Sea. It's a gorgeous area in the UK. It's one of those places that you can get really nice donuts by the pier. But whilst he was born in Southend-on-Sea, his family moved to Dagenham when he was just one year of age. And it's said that Stephen Port was quite bullied in school. And the result of that is that he became quite a loner. Also, as he moved through his years, he became a chef. He worked in a stagecoach bus depot in West Ham and he actually lived with his parents until his early 30s, which arguably in this day and age is not unusual because it's very expensive to move out of your parents' home. And I don't know, maybe you have parents like me who never want their children to leave. But arguably, back in the 70s when you were born at that point, you would have expected to have moved out usually in your late teens, certainly in your early 20s. He is not a child of this time. He is a child of the 70s. So that is quite unusual. But having said that, if you struggle to forge good relationships, if you haven't managed to create intimate partnerships, then why move out of your parents' home? It's very cheap. And usually the food is good and free, in fact. He stays there, like I said, until his early 30s, but then he does buy a one-bedroomed flat that's located in Barking, East London. Now, I fully believe that the reason that he bought the flat in Barking in East London was because he had certain sexual fetishes and, I don't know about you, my parents used to let me come and go as I liked when I was a young person, but I think they would have drawn a line at things like chemsex parties. I'm just throwing it out there. I'd have needed to do that 
under my own roof as opposed to theirs. But I think that's the motivation. And one of his neighbours, a guy called Ryan, he said that Stephen had what he considered was an insatiable thirst for young teenage men. Straight away, me and Stephen Port would have an issue if we were in a room together. But this tells you about the type of sexual behaviour that Stephen Port is engaging in. I'm not saying that he was abusing children. I'm not saying that they were not above the age of consent, although it would be very unsurprising to me if he was having sex with people who were under the age of consent. But his particular type, attraction-wise, is for the younger teenage man. And he had what's known as a preference for twinks. So twinks are a particular group of individuals in the gay community who fit a particular look. So they're young, slim men. They tend to have quite a boyish appearance. So even if they're in their early 20s, they will look really young. And it's older guys on the whole who really go for that specific look. And like I said, lots of older guys who are gay like twinks. As in consenting over the age that's appropriate young men who happen to want to go for an older guy who can give them, shall we say, protection, sometimes a level of security financially, and the older guy gets a really good looking young man on their arm, so to speak. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. We see that consistently in the world with heterosexual couples where an older man is with a younger woman, and even these days with people like Cher, who I think is like three or four decades older than her partner. At the end of the day, if that's what floats your boat, fine. Personally, I like to be able to remember the TV shows in the day of my own generation as opposed to in the day of my kids' generation. I would find it really weird having a conversation with a guy who I was in an intimate relationship who actually watched Peppa Pig as a child as opposed to as an adult watching their child. But that's by the by. So he likes young guys. And Ryan also said that Stephen Port, in his opinion, had quite a peculiar and quite a childish personality. Apparently he'd also got a history of becoming violent with previous boyfriends. So we're introduced to somebody who has been bullied, but then has grown essentially into a bully, who seeks out a particular type of individual, one that he would undoubtedly be able to dominate, and also uses violence to control those individuals. That is not looking good for this kind of personality, is it? So there is a particular paraphilia that is known as somnophilia. Somnophilia is wanting to have sex with somebody who is unconscious. And it feels like that was where Stephen Port's appetite lay. So he really enjoyed drugging and raping the young men who may consensually have gone on a date with him or consensually have spent time with him, consensually would have had sex with him, but that's not where his interest level lies. It's the feeling of absolute power and dominance over an individual who's completely helpless because they're unconscious. So over that three and a half year period, he is drugging these young men so that he can live out the fantasy that he has with literally physically creating an individual who cannot consent because they're unconscious and who isn't aware of what he's doing with all these different people but he actually kills four of his victims they all die from an overdose so Stephen would use GHB which is gamma hydroxybutyric acid that's how he would affect making his victims unconscious and in small doses it's a drug that basically can cause drowsiness, it can reduce your heart rate, and I would say sometimes it is actually used as a party drug. So in smaller levels, it can lead to feelings of euphoria. It's also really helpful for relaxation. And if you think about sexual inhibitions, obviously that can reduce inhibitions. And if you're thinking about, shall we say, certain sexual practices, relaxing of certain areas of the body can also be helpful. And it can also increase your sex drive. So it can be used particularly in things like chem sex environments. It's actually, with respect to myself and my generation, become known as a date rape drug. So when I was growing up, you were concerned about somebody putting some of that in your drink. 
because it would genuinely render you helpless, you wouldn't have any control of your body and very bad things could happen. I'm aware that different people in different places use this particular drug in different ways, but certainly whenever I hear of it, it always symbolizes and signifies rape in my mind. And the reason for that is, like I said, all those positives that you get in those small doses, if you increase it even slightly, it can mean that that person will become unconscious and raising it even slightly can also mean that you don't just become unconscious, you can die. Now, despite the very obvious risk, Hort would actually often give an overdose of GHB to his victims because he was so motivated by his sexual predilections and his desire to play out the fantasies he had in his mind with an unconscious individual and with an individual who can't consent, that he would prioritize that desire over his actual consideration for their lives and for what might play out if he gets the dosage wrong. So his first victim is a guy called Anthony Walgate. Anthony was raised in Hull. When he was 23 years of age, he was living in London. He'd moved there for university. He was studying fashion. He'd always wanted to be a famous fashion designer. So he really is getting his stuff together. He's getting his life together. He's moving forward. He's working hard towards that goal. And Anthony's mum said that whilst he was in London, she felt like he really blossomed, that he really stepped in to who he was truly meant to be. He loved his friends. He absolutely adored the life that he'd made there. She said that he was a really clever, funny, talented young man and that apparently he was the life and soul of the party. He was always concerned about everybody else's happiness. He always wanted to make people laugh. Now, Anthony also occasionally worked as an escort. And a friend of his said one of the problems where Anthony was concerned was that managing money wasn't necessarily his strongest point. So he would do the escorting because it meant that he could bring in some extra income. But we can all agree that that can also place you in a position of danger. It shouldn't. You should be able to be a sex worker and happily return home safely every single day of the week. But we also know that when you look at risk factors, you are far more likely to find yourself violated or abused when you are engaging in that kind of work. It shouldn't be the way it is, but it is. So clearly, he just put himself in a position that we wouldn't wish for him ideally. But nonetheless, he's probably done it many times and it hasn't caused any issues. He just wants to make the extra money that he needs. But one of the things that's notable about Anthony is he was very cautious about who he met up with and he was bright in the way that he did that. So he'd always send a photo and he'd always send the address of where he'd be going so he could tell his friends, this is where I'm at, this is where I'm going to be, this is who I'm going to meet. And that is such a powerfully important thing to do. And Anthony was doing it. So he understood risk factors. Yes, he also knew that he was more likely to find himself in a position of risk when he's meeting strangers, but at least he had this protective mechanism around him so that people would be able to identify where he was last seen and who he was last with. So we get to the 17th of June, 2014. Anthony very sadly meets Port. This is through a gay escort agency website called Sleepy Boys. Now, immediately we are drawn to the title, Sleepy Boys. So this is clearly a site that, shall we say, encourages individuals who may want somebody to enact being unconscious or is more willing to take drugs that might make them seem more compliant through maybe acting out a fantasy where they are pretending they are fully unable to consent. We know out there there is a site for every single kind of fetish, but the fact that it's sleepy boys immediately introduces us to Stephen Port's MO. It's what he's interested in, it's what turns him on. Stephen Port apparently promised him £800 for the night. That's a lot of money. £800 is a lot of cash. Even if you're not into that kinky stuff, even if it really doesn't interest you, the idea of role-playing, being unconscious, chances are you're going to be like, that's 800 quid. That's a lot of money. Maybe I can just close my eyes, go to my happy place, not really think about it again, walk away, quids in. They decided on a meeting place, which was Barking Station. Anthony arrived at the station at around 10.15 that night. But sadly, 
no one would ever hear from Anthony again. Because on June the 19th, 2014, Stephen Port calls an ambulance. This is at 4 a.m. And he calls them reporting that he's found a collapsed young man outside of a block of apartments in London. He said he'd noticed him as he was driving past. On the 999 call, he said, it looks like he's collapsed or had a seizure or something, or he's just drunk. When the police attended, an officer did immediately notice that there was blood and bruising on the torso, so therefore he thought maybe the death was suspicious. Also, there was no mobile phone on him, but he also found that there was a bottle of GHB in his pocket. There's a young boy, looks like he's collapsed outside. He looks like he's collapsed or had a seizure or something. He's just always just drunk. Did you see anything happen at all? No. Now, of course, the reality is that that young man is Anthony, who Stephen had literally dragged outside after he's given him this overdose and after he's raped him. He'd also been the person who'd placed that bottle of GHB in his pocket. He was also the individual who got rid of his mobile phone. And he did this because he wanted to deflect any suspicion away from himself. So he basically leads the investigators to believe that Anthony had given himself an overdose. Now, in spite of the fact that Anthony's body clearly had bruising on it, the death wasn't treated as suspicious. So it wasn't investigated as such. And what's really scary is when Stephen Port called the police about the body that he'd found, it turned out that the body was literally outside Stephen's own front door. So Anthony had literally been placed in front of Stephen Port's door. So he basically concocts this story saying that he found Anthony on his way home from a late shift at work. He said he didn't actually know the victim. And they buy into it. Even though this young man has been found slumped outside the man who's found him home, and even though there's bruising on the body, the police just accept that the drugs are there and therefore he must have overdosed. Now, Anthony's family and friends, they really were unhappy with this. They felt that his death should be considered to be suspicious, but the police wouldn't listen to them. And that's so shocking. Let's just change the gender and change the sexuality for a minute. Let's imagine that a woman is found slumped outside a man's home. She's got bruising on her body. And yes, there is a drug known as a date rape drug, so to speak, in her pocket. Would they handle that situation in the same way? Would they immediately say, well, she's clearly OD'd? Or would they think, this is strange that this man who lives at this address has found this woman propped up against his property door and she's got drugs in her pocket that are known to the authorities to be used in rape situations. It's really unsettling when you see a potential stereotype being used in a way that's so damaging. Because bear in mind, Port is a very dangerous man. And if he's walking our streets, then the streets he's walking are certainly not safe. Now, one of Anthony's friends told the police that Anthony had actually told him that he'd met up with Stephen Port a few days before his death. At this point, when he's confronted with this information, Port denies knowing Anthony, but then, he did indeed say that Anthony had come to his flat and had actually died there whilst he'd taken a self-inflicted overdose of GHB. Stephen then said that he'd gone to work and he'd returned to find Anthony dead. So he said at this point, even though he'd done nothing wrong, he'd really panicked, so he'd put Anthony's body outside, called the ambulance. Shockingly, after first concocting a story which suggests that firstly he doesn't know who this individual is, that he's just found him, just reported the incident to the emergency services, has no idea what's gone on, even when it's discovered that that's a complete fabrication, even though this guy's bruised, when he admits, okay, well, okay, I did know him a little bit, and we did actually spend time together. And he did die in my home. But it was an accident. I had nothing to do with it. So I just thought I'd drag him outside because I panicked. They believe him. And they just rule him out as 
a murder suspect. By the way, they took Stephen Port's laptop at this point because clearly you're going to want to see whether there's anything technology wise. It is a footprint that can lead you piece by piece to the suggestion that this individual is guilty of more than just finding an individual dead. But in spite of the fact they've taken the laptop, it wasn't submitted for examination until 10 months after Anthony had been killed. So bear in mind, 10 months. How many people could somebody kill during that period of time if they're a serial killer? And yet, that's how long it takes. And this means that they missed really important evidence, key things. So Stephen Porter searched things such as unconscious boys rape videos and date rape drugs. They absolutely are incriminating searches. This young man has been found dead. That particular drug is in his pocket. And this man, who was the last person to see him alive, is literally searching information about date rape drugs and also about unconscious boys being raped. It's, as far as I'm concerned, clear in those searches that Stephen Paul is the reason why Anthony is dead. Gets to the 20th of June, 2014. This is when they carry out the autopsy to determine how Anthony has died. And indeed, they note that there's bruising under his arms, that his pants were inside out and back to front, which to anybody with any sense of logic demonstrates that somebody else dressed them. You know, it's obvious the clothes have been taken off and put back on by somebody else. But in spite of the fact that that's obvious and that the bruising is there, they determined that a drug overdose had occurred, but they actually couldn't determine what the actual cause of death was. So at this point, they end up sending the samples off for toxicology. A few months later, the toxicology reports come back and reveal that it was indeed an overdose of GHB, which had officially caused Anthony's death. But like I said, they're not looking at this as a potential murder. They're looking at this as an accidental death. Now, obviously, Stephen Port has lied to the police. He said that he didn't know who Anthony was. He concocted that initial fabrication of finding him outside. So understandably, on June 26, 2014, Port's arrested for perverting the course of justice because he made a false police statement. But he's let out on bail. What could possibly go wrong? I mean, letting some kind of sexual predator who lie to the police about bodies of individuals that they were last seen with being found outside their flat. What could possibly go wrong? Well, it seems lots could go wrong, in fact. And like I said, it's really difficult when you cover cases where you know that massive missed opportunities took place and we're talking about lives of infinite meaning being lost because of it. So, Gabriel Kavari. Gabriel was Slovakian. He'd moved to London after he'd finished university. He was working in a shop in Surrey. But his big dream was to become a translator. He wanted to work for the, the NHS or, ironically, for the police. And his family and his boyfriend, Thierry Amorio, they were living in Spain. So, obviously, he was over in the UK. He was trying to make strides in his career. He was an individual who was clearly motivated and dedicated to his future. His brother described him as being very smart, talented, a really kind person, apparently with a passion for drawing and languages. And he said that Gabriel was the most talented in the family in terms of artistic expression. He said that he was incredibly exceptional, that he was really ambitious. But if there was one thing that was noted as a bit of an issue for Gabriel is that he trusted people too much. He said that he was one of those people who didn't see the bad in others. And a friend of his said that he was just a really nice and sweet-natured individual. So even though we want to trust the world, there's always a point where we need to think about some personal boundaries because the truth is there are bad people out there and bad people can see vulnerability in others and exploit it. And it feels like Gabriel had all the hallmarks of a really wonderful human being and that makes you fair game for predators because they think, well... I can manipulate them more easily because they're going to be seeing the good in me, not the bad in me. And it's so upsetting that that's true psychologically and emotionally and socially, but it is. It's why good people have really horrible things happen to them by people who should know better, but clearly do not and take advantage of the very caring natures of these individuals. So on August the 23rd, 2014, Gabriel ends up moving in with Stephen Port. 
Now, Gabriel was only 22 years at the time, so he was a young man. And of course, Stephen's neighbour, Ryan, who's already got quite a lot of misgivings about Port, he met Gabriel and he said that when he spoke to him, he was really pleasant, he was really articulate. And actually, Ryan went so far as to text Stephen Port to tell him that he'd met Gabriel and he thought he was really nice. Port texted back, I'm taking good care of him. He, he. That makes me feel uncomfortable. I imagine it made Ryan feel uncomfortable. It's the implication, isn't it? He's not talking about, I'm taking good care of him, making him really nice soup twice a day and ensuring that he's taking his vitamins and minerals. We know it's sexually motivated. And Port is considerably older and he's in power because this young man is staying in his home and that makes it difficult when you consider what Gabriel's opportunities are because he's relying on Port and if Port is coming on to him and is putting him in a position where he feels like he's maybe not got a place to stay unless he reciprocates, that can make it very, very challenging. And Port was a very odd human being, full stop. He's an individual who changes his appearance quite a lot to try to look younger and he comes across as an absolute creep and for somebody like Gabriel who's smart and sweet and lovely I would imagine the attention that Port is giving him is not welcome at all but I also don't think that Gabriel would be the type of person who would be nasty to Port or disrespectful towards him he's probably just trying to manage the situation in a pleasant manner Gabriel actually texted a friend of his and said that he didn't have his own room at the time that he was staying with Port and that he actually slept on the sofa. He also described Port as a bit different and said he didn't want to sleep in Port's bed. So again, the fact that he's having those conversations with a friend, that Port's a bit different, I mean, that's saying something very pleasant in comparison to what most of us would say about Port. I can describe him a bit different wouldn't be the words I'd use. There would be a whole heap of more aggressive statements about this kind of character. But the very fact he's noting that he didn't want to sleep in Port's bed, that suggests that Port is pressuring to do so. And that's really weird, isn't it? You know, somebody says they'll put you up for a few days, a few weeks, and you move in, you sleep on the sofa, and like, oh, just come and stay in my bed. You'd be immediately drawn into the reality that they want more from this situation than you want. But like I said, it's difficult when it comes down to housing, particularly if the housing isn't expensive and it's not just about walking away because you're feeling awkward. It's about having to find a new place to live. So I also fully understand why Gabriel was probably putting up with things on reflection he wishes he hadn't. On August of 26, 2014, Ryan meets Stephen Port, has a chat and He's told by Paul that Gabriel's left abruptly and later says that the reason that he did that was he'd gone back to his home country and that once he'd got back to his home country, he actually had died. Stephen Paul also at this point changes his phone number. So that's strange behaviour. I don't know about you guys, but most of us, I believe, are like me. I will have the same phone number until I'm 109. When I'm 109 and I pop my clogs, everyone will be like, we knew her number because she had it for 89 years. The truth is, we don't like changing our phone number. I know you have to occasionally, but for the most part, you don't. If you're changing your phone number, if you're trying to disguise your mobile digital footprint, often there's a reason behind that. You've been naughty, or in this case, far worse. You are trying to hide or disguise your behavior. And Telling Ryan that this young man had actually died when he'd gone back to his home country, well, that's an absolute, isn't it? There's nowhere to go. It's not like Ryan can get in contact with him and check on him. He's been told in no uncertain terms that this young man is now dead. It's strange for Ryan, but he's not going to question it. He's not got a close relationship with Gabriel. On the 28th of August... A dog walker, and just bear this in mind because it is just utterly shocking what happens, but a dog walker discovers Gabriel's body. They're walking through St. Margaret's Churchyard. Now bear in mind, St. Margaret's Churchyard is like two streets away from Port's home. 
it's on the grounds of Barking Abbey. And they find Gabriel's body propped up against the wall. He's wearing sunglasses. He's got no mobile phone. And he also has a small bottle of GHB in his pocket. And the actual dog walker who discovered Gabriel's body said immediately they felt it was suspicious. It didn't look like this is how this guy had ended up there. It looked staged. So his clothes were ruched up around his upper abdomen. She felt like he didn't look like he dressed himself. Now, this is a lay person. This is somebody without a day in investigations experience. But she looks at the scene and is like, ah, it doesn't feel right. It doesn't look okay. And again, if you are the police and another body in a pretty short amount of time has turned up, and I don't know, not only does it look like they've not dressed themselves, they also find a small bottle of GHB. You're going to be like, oh, spider senses. I'm recognising that this feels like a common theme with another investigation that we've had. Because at the end of the day, it's very unusual to find two guys dead in such a short amount of time who are young with GHB in the pocket, almost posed. But no. No. Police didn't feel that way. Didn't treat it as suspicious at all. And also, Gabriel's death not only wasn't not linked to Anthony's, they didn't even bother informing Gabriel's family that he was dead. Horrific. Now, obviously, to anybody with, I don't know, more than four brain cells, it should have raised alarm bells that Anthony's body had been found close by the other body that had been found only a few months earlier. They were of a similar age. They died in similar circumstances. At the end of the day, you're like, oh, victim profile seems to be very similar. Maybe, just maybe, we have the potential of a serial killer on our hands. No, nope, that didn't happen. Then we get to the case of Daniel Whitworth. So Daniel Whitworth was somebody who was said to be really quite outdoorsy. He was really active. He loved riding his bike. Apparently his grandmother referred to him as a total joy. His father said one of the things about Daniel was that he was one of those people who knew where he was going, knew what he wanted to do, and he wanted to get into the world of catering once he'd left college. He said that he was one of those people who always had his priorities in the right place. He worked really hard. And indeed, when he left college, he did get a job as a chef at One Moorgate Place and Canary Wharf, which he absolutely loved. So another individual who was loving life, living life fully, doing exactly what he said he was going to do, chasing his dreams. But unfortunately, in spite of Daniel's life heading in the right direction, he has a sliding doors moment, which ultimately leads to his death when he meets Stephen Port through Fit Lads. On the 18th of September 2014, the two of them arranged to meet. Daniel's just 23 years of age at the time. So Daniel leaves work a little bit early and he goes over to Stephen Port's flat. The next morning, you won't be surprised to note that Stephen Port deletes his fit lad's account. So this is an individual who's consistently trying to disguise the behaviour that he's up to online. On the 20th of September 2014, Daniel's body is discovered against the same graveyard wall where Gabriel was found. He was again found propped up in a sitting position in exactly the same pose as Gabriel. He had no mobile phone and a small bottle of GHB in his pocket. Are we just talking about a serial killer who's even leaving a signature? I know the GHB is being left there because it wants to indicate this individual has died of an overdose of it, but it's more than that, isn't it? You don't need to leave the bottle there. The police are clearly going to investigate on a toxicology level how that person's died. The fact that it's there, it's not just about him leaving the trace and the police connect it. It's about a calling card. They all have that little bottle of GHB. It's a, I did it, here I am. Look at how I connect these killings. That's my thoughts, genuinely on it. I know it tends to be stated that Port was literally doing it to try to indicate how that individual had died and deflects away from his potential involvement. But for me, these individuals sat in the same positions, 
their clothes in similar situations and also that little bottle. It's a hallmark of a particular killer. And I believe that psychologically and very consciously, Port was doing that because it's a reminder as far as he is concerned, even if it's just a reminder for himself that he's responsible for those killings. It's a connector. Unbelievably, Daniel's body was actually discovered by the same dog walker who had found Gabriel's body. And that dog walker, who had initially felt that the scene was really suspicious when she found Gabriel, said finding Daniel's body in exactly the same circumstance, well, that would be suspicious to anyone. But apparently not by the police. Yeah. Allegedly, the police were not considering that three bodies of three young men all in the same situation with a small bottle of GHB, that doesn't seem a little bit fishy. And it's also worth noting that Port adds an additional layer to this murder. So not only does Stephen kill Daniel, he also goes ahead and writes a fake suicide note for him. And he places this suicide note in his left hand. And this suicide note is explaining, conveniently, that Daniel had basically been in a relationship with Gabriel Cavari, and Gabriel had accidentally overdosed whilst they were both taking GHB. So it's claimed that Daniel had basically sacrificed himself in a suicide because he couldn't live with the guilt of what he'd done. Now this is especially cruel because this places responsibility for Gabriel's death directly on Daniel. That must have been utterly heartbreaking for the family. Clearly, it's not true, but that's what would be going out in the press. And the family having to manage the loss of their loved one and his apparent connection with another death of a young man. Now we know that this is again an attempt to direct the blame away from himself, but I also again feel it's a power trip. It's poor enjoying thinking, what's the additional layer I can outline here? I'm gonna make a suicide note. I'm gonna carve a story that neatly connects Daniel and Gabriel so that the police can package that away. Because arguably it wasn't required. The police have not investigated the other cases, finding bodies very thoroughly. So arguably when they find Daniel's body, why are they gonna be thinking that Gabriel's got anything to do with it? I think that Paul is living in a fantasy now. He wants to be involved in the case. Bear in mind, when we consider serial killers, very often they are so narcissistic they want to be the centre of it. And even though Port won't want to be caught for the killings, he will certainly wish to feel like a director in a movie when it concerns the deaths of these young men. And even though, like I said, it's convenient to try to deflect the attention away from himself regarding the authorities' perception of what's really played out, I genuinely think he's getting a real kick from this. He's getting stimulated by going a little bit further each time. For example, the first body is found outside his door, but then he actually takes the second and third body to exactly the same place, poses them in exactly the same way. The second one having sunglasses put on, now this one's got a suicide note. It's upping the ante and drama on every single kill. And I think that's fueling and satisfying him. Now, Daniel's friends and family, they didn't buy into it at all. They did not think that Daniel had killed himself. His stepmother actually described him as a really happy lad. He didn't have any reason to take him his own life. He was somebody who had everything to live for. It just did not make sense. I also appreciate that people watching this will know people who have taken their own life without any warning whatsoever. So I know that it does not always go hand in hand that an individual is coming across as depressed or unhappy before they remove themselves from this world. But for the most part, there are warning signs and Daniel didn't have any. During the actual post-mortem, the pathologist again finds bruising under Daniel's arms and to the front of his chest, which clearly, even if you're unschooled in this area, you can link it to the manual handling of a person being dragged or pulled. Now they believe, as the pathologist, that this had most likely happened prior to death. Also, Daniel's body was found in a blue bedsheet, 
and the pathologist recommended that that blue bed sheet, understandably, should be sent for examination. However, to add insult to injury, the DNA testing was never carried out. I kid you not, it was never carried out. Could you uh, please test this sheet that's been found with the deceased? Because it could be that there are, shall we say, evidential factors that could lead us to the killer, such as fluids, bodily DNA, things like that. Just have a look, because it's unusual, isn't it, to find young people dead in such a manner. Yeah, I'll do that. Okay, thanks. What are you doing? I'm doing absolutely nothing. Doing nothing. Aren't you going to send off the sheet for the samples with the DNA idea? No, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to ignore everything you say because at the end of the day, it's just young men dying in incredibly similar circumstances with exactly the same bottle of drugs on them and no one knows why. So I'm just going to go with the, oh, these things happen idea. Honestly, they didn't actually carry out the DNA testing. And the reason this is a massive failing, aside from the very obvious, is that this was Stephen's bed sheet. And bear in mind, the police already had Stephen's DNA on record. And that would have meant, just throwing it out there, that maybe they could have linked the bed sheet to him if it had actually been analysed. As with the other deaths, the samples were sent off for toxicology because they couldn't determine the actual cause of the death. But before the toxicology results were received by the police, the investigation into Daniel's death was closed. Before they even knew. What is happening here? Is it the same person who closed the case who was asked to go and get the samples sorted from the actual sheet? Because it feels like one person might just be really, really inept and useless at a job. But right now it feels like there's a multiple amount of people who seem to be doing jack all when we're dealing with the most serious of crimes. But just close it. Just close it. Don't need to investigate it. Absolute failure beyond belief on behalf of the police. Absolutely diabolical. And when they do finally get the results back from the toxicology, it shows that he died from a fatal dose of GHB. But it's horrific that time and time again, so far throughout the case I'm sharing with you today, there are glaring failures. It's terrifying that a dog walker shows more insight when they find a body than the police do. And another failing from the police in Daniel's case was regarding the actual suicide note. So a section of the note shown to Daniel's father. Now bear in mind when you're dealing with a suicide, and I have dealt with an immediate suicide in my family with my father, and I read that note, I found the note when I found my dad. I can tell you I literally couldn't make out the words, I remembered a bit of it, everything was deeply traumatic. You are veiled in horror and you can't see straight, metaphorically and literally. So I understand that if you take a section of a suicide note to a parent and say, can you confirm whether that's your son's writing, you're not going to be in the real world. Maybe come back in four years and ask me, because by then maybe I'll have vision that's 2020 again. For a long time you won't. So the fact that when he's asked to confirm whether it's his son's writing, his dad said he couldn't be sure, well, that's because he's dealing with traumatic grief. But he's not saying it is. He's saying, I don't know. I don't know whether it is. He probably would need to look at some letters of his son or cards of his son to confirm it. However, the police were like, so you're not sure? No, I am not sure. I'm dealing with traumatic grief. And therefore, right now, I can't confirm whether they are or not my son's written words. So you're saying that you're not sure? Yeah, I'm not sure. So you're saying that you're sure? I'm saying that I'm, I'm, I'm saying I'm not sure. You're saying that you confirm that you're sure. I said I'm not sure, right, okay. I'm just confirming that you're sure, because it's great that you're sure, because it's good that we are sure that you're sure. That's what happened. I'm not saying that that actual conversation played out, by the way. I'm saying that somehow him saying, 
he wasn't sure, led to the police saying it was an authentic letter. Unbelievable. The officer who literally spoke to Daniel's father and was directly told that his father couldn't say whether it was actually the writing of his son, just went ahead and said that it had been confirmed it was his son's writing, which was not the case. I mean, we all want people like this, don't we, working on the case of a loved one being killed. No one could ever possibly be concerned about things going wrong with such diligent investigating. Now, something amazing happens, but equally something terrible because it highlights just how diabolical the investigation is around this case. One of Gabriel's friends, John Pat, he found it really suspicious that there were these local deaths, very local in fact, when you consider that bodies have been found in exactly the same place, that were incredibly similar to the death of his friend. So he literally, on numerous occasions, tries to contact the police to voice his concerns because he, he thought that there was a strong likelihood that these young men were being murdered. And he'd actually discovered that there were these older men who were having chemsex parties, inviting younger guys there and then drugging these younger guys and having sex with them when these younger guys were unaware. And they were bragging about it, that this was something that was not hidden to some degree. It was a movement of older predatory gay men who were using the opportunity of having these young men available to them to actually lure them into a situation where there was drugs, etc., not knowing that the ultimate aim of that was to render them helpless so they could have their way with them. And he started to believe that potentially he was dealing with a reality that one of these kind of men had started to actually kill. And he actually says in a BBC documentary that he was somebody who actually felt afraid for his own safety. He was thinking, my God, if there is some kind of person like this on the loose and they're not doing anything about it and they're not connecting the crimes, then I could be at risk too. And it's very, very true that that could be the case. So he's knocking on the door. He even goes to his friend's inquest. So he watches as the coroner questions the police. He said the police didn't know what they were doing. They really didn't have their house in order. They hadn't got information that was really important. And the coroner themselves actually recorded an open verdict, which is important because it means that it can be returned to him, of course. So this particular friend, John, was deeply disturbed because he was doing investigations personally and he was showing in his mind a firm link between the deaths of these young men and a strong likelihood that a serial killer was on the loose. Now, Stephen Port is now likely feeling that he can do anything. He can achieve whatever he wants without interference from the authorities, because let's be honest, they're doing a dire, dire job. Now, whilst the investigation is going on, and this is another reason why I genuinely feel that Port enjoyed leaving the little signatures that he left, such as the little bottle of GHB on his victims. I genuinely think he was getting a massive kick out of it. And that's really reinforced when he takes out a fake Facebook account under the name John Look. So he pretends to be this 21 year old gay former porn star from California. You think in 21, former porn star, not a very long history there, is there? Maybe 26, you could have gone, oh yeah, they come and go quickly, these porn stars. That sounds inappropriate when I think about how I just said that. But you know what I'm saying. <laughs> when I say they come and go, I mean, you know, it eats you up, that industry, doesn't it? But 21, it's very young, isn't it? But he's saying that that's what he was, a former porn star. So obviously indicating probably that for any other gay guy, they're thinking, well, he's probably going to be endowed in a positive way. And it's clever to create this kind of disguise. California, so he's going to be good looking, tan, surfy potentially. You know, it conjures this view in your mind. And the reason that he does that is he was actually trying to use that profile to acquire information about the police investigation. So he's trying to figure out what people know in the gay area, particularly younger people, as regards the information that they might have about the police investigation. Now, of course, the irony is here that Stephen Port probably thought there was a police investigation, but there wasn't. Because the police were just like, oh, what another body, never mind, it's just coincidence. But because he wants to be involved in figuring out how much they know, 
this is why he sets his account up. He then uses that same profile to contact Thierry, who is Gabriel's boyfriend, and he's using that profile to connect with him. He says that he had actually met Gabriel on a dating app Grinder, and that they had had sex in August. He then goes on to tell Thierry that Gabriel and Daniel had actually met at a party and then allegedly gone to have sex in the churchyard of Barking Abbey. And this is where Daniel had given Gabriel a drug overdose. So again, he wants to be part of the story, doesn't he? He can't let it lie. It's not enough for him just to have murdered these people. He wants to create this narrative that's completely untrue because he wants to feel the pain that he's caused. Thierry has lost his partner and he's obviously enjoying concocting this story and carving out a narrative that never existed. That's so dark and malevolent. He was also writing online that he knew Daniel and Gabriel and that they had apparently gone to an orgy together in Barking where they'd taken loads of drugs, where they'd been with older men who'd taken advantage of the younger boys there. And this is where John Pat had actually heard the information. This is why he'd initially gone to the police. But even when he went and discussed this information that he'd found and turned up, the police were actually reluctant to tell him anything because he wasn't next of kin. And they never got back to John regarding the claims made by John Luck on Facebook. Now, John Pat was relentless. He even went so far as to get in contact with LGBT charities, the gay press. He also got in touch with a campaigner called Peter Tatchell. And he was so concerned, he actually contacted the police on behalf of John because he thought maybe he had a little bit of power because he's known in the press in the UK. But they didn't do anything again. They acted like they were really disinterested in the information. And again, they reaffirmed at this point the deaths were not being treated as suspicious. Massive incompetency throughout this investigation so far. And even concern from members of the public who were genuinely bringing valid information, actually getting advocates from the gay community to contact the police on their behalf. None of that made the police reconsider. And yet, it's like the most obvious connection ever. All these bodies turning up in exactly the same death with a small bottle of GHB, all gay, all young men, Surely, anyone with an ounce of experience in investigating murders would be looking at this and thinking, there is a connector here. Now, in March 2015, Paul actually gets sent to prison for eight months for perverting the course of justice. But he gets released early. That's in June of that year. So bear in mind, that's only three months into his initial incarceration. So a very small amount of time. And unfortunately... Now he's walking around emboldened, isn't he? He's got away literally with murder as far as he's concerned. And the problem there is we see where serial killers are concerned that that tends to make them feel unstoppable. And because of that, another person dies. Jack Taylor. Jack lived in Dagenham. He lived with his parents. His mum said he was a really kind, really funny person. He was really somebody who cared about everyone. He worked as a warehouse as a forklift truck driver. He was not out as being gay. So he was somebody who was obviously struggling to some degree with his identity. I can imagine if you're working as a forklift truck driver, it doesn't always feel in environments like that, that there's a big permission base to be who you want to be and who you are. You should have no shame whatsoever in coming out as a gay human being, nothing wrong with it, as we all know. But unfortunately, in certain circumstances and environments, people can say things that would make you, if you're gay, feel uncomfortable admitting that you're gay. Because there can be, shall we say, offensive banter in certain environments. And I imagine for him working in that environment, he may well have felt like he wouldn't get accepted in the way that he deserved if he were to be honest about being gay. Often, that isn't true. Often, even in the environments where you think you'll be rejected, it's the opposite. But I understand the resistance and it's very common. Now, as he wasn't out as being gay in public, it didn't mean that he wasn't seeking relationships with other men and he was actually using gay dating sites at the time. And again, this is where unfortunately he comes across Stephen Port. So on September the 13th, 2015, he'd actually been to a local 
pub that evening. He drank some alcohol and unfortunately for him, he met up with Port around 3 a.m. This was at Barking Station. He'd been chatting to him on Grindr. For those of you who don't know what Grindr is, Grindr is an app and basically it will tell you where another person is in relation to you on the app if you're interested in them. So say you want to have sex with somebody within a 20 foot radius, the chances are you'll be able to do so if you've got Grindr. And while some people will look for relationships on it, very often it's very much about just going, having a bit of fun, saying goodbye. It's very effective if you want, shall we say, quite a high level of sex in your world. It will offer you that. So that's what Grinder is. People do meet and have relationships and get married and live happily ever after on it as well. I'm not saying it doesn't do that, but I'm saying for the most part, it's a very effective way of getting sex quickly. So they were chatting on Grinder. They then go back to Port Flat. The next morning, so that was September the 14th, 2015. Unsurprisingly, as we have seen before, Port tries to disguise connection with We've seen that within all the other cases, eradicate him, so to speak. So he blocks him on Grindr. And then later he actually deletes his own Grindr account. He also texts a flatmate of his trying to convince him not to return home at that point. So he wants some time and space. You won't be surprised to hear that that night, Jack's body was found against a wall in a similar sitting position. Even worse, in the same churchyard where Gabriel and Daniel had been discovered. And again, he's got that small bottle of GHB, a tourniquet and a syringe and no mobile phone. Could anybody require any more information than this to know that it was a serial killer and that this serial killer is both relentless and confident and growing in shall we say the drama so now he's got the tourniquet etc now he's got the shringe he's literally taking the mick out of the authorities he's just making this into a whole theater he's loving it that's what stephen port's doing why would you place the body in the same churchyard people will say Well, at the end of the day, Port didn't know what to do with the body. Well, just take them elsewhere. He is dangling the carrot in front of the investigators and they haven't been seeing it. You don't take a body back to a churchyard, pose it in the same way with the same items on the body, unless you want the police to know it's you. He wants the police to know he's responsible for all the kills. He doesn't want them to find him but he wants them to connect the killings. Again, it's found that he had fatal levels of GHB in his body and they found that his death had occurred due to a mix of GHB and alcohol. Now, Jack's family immediately know there's something absolutely not right about this. Jack was anti-drugs, so there was no way he was going to die of a self-inflicted overdose. Also, Jack's two older sisters, they start investigating their brother's death because they know There is absolutely no way that this young man would have died this way. And I love families. I just love how families will not let these things go like dogs with a bone. And the same with the friend who just wanted the police to investigate further. There are people with indelible links to the humans that are lost who love them so deeply. They will not let their legacy get lost. So the sisters, much like John Papp, realise These young men embarking have all died in similar circumstances. So they go to the police and they ask them, could there be a connection? This seems a little bit too close for comfort. They seem so similar. And guess what happened? The police were like, yeah, no, no, there's no connection. It is unbelievable. What? Yeah, there's no connection. There's no connect. There's no connection whatsoever. Could you just run through what the deaths are? Oh, right, okay, well, the deaths that we've investigated that are completely not connected, this is what happened. The first one was found slumped outside an address and it turned out they'd overdosed on GHB. 
the second body, the third body and the fourth body, they were all found in the same churchyard, ironically by the same dog walk for two of them. And they were all found posed, looking like they've been dressed by somebody else with a little GHB bottle on them. They're all gay, they're all young, they all meet a kind of similar victim profile. So they're the cases we've been investigating, but obviously they were just overdoses. You just literally connected them all, like as if they were all connected. No, it's just coincidence. They have nothing to do with each other. It's all irrelevant. It's just one of those unlucky places. What I would suggest is don't go near that churchyard at night because it seems to be a place where a lot of people OD for absolutely no reason whatsoever, usually without any history of any mental illness or mental health problems. Yeah, so uh, anyway, I've got to go because I've got to do something like send a sheet off for genetic or DNA or ancestral or something testing. Oh, is that a sandwich? Honestly, I kid you not. Literally, even though now they've had several people saying this has got to be connected, they don't believe it is. They're just dismissed. But then CCTV footage is discovered. And guess what? It features Jack walking with Stephen Port near Barking Station. This is literally from the night before Jack's death. At this point, the police release the footage eventually. This is because Jack's sisters are saying this footage exists of the person who is last known to be with him. We want the public to come forward and say if they know who he is. So anyway, on the 15th of October 2015, this is within two days of the footage being released, Thank God Stephen Port is identified from the CCTV. At this point, finally, he's arrested on suspicion of the murders of four young men. The four young men whose lives he had horrifically cut short. Now, bear in mind, we're talking about deaths of individuals who should never have had the opportunity to be murdered because this man should have been in prison. So even though they've got him now, that doesn't bring back to life those that were lost because of the incompetence. So the same month that they identify and arrest Stephen Port, the Metropolitan Police voluntarily refer themselves to the Independent Police Complaints Commission. It's not as if it's an individual though, is it? It's not as if the person is turning themselves to, in to be actually independently looked at. This is the Met Police referring themselves to the Independent Police Complaints Commission because they have to. It's protocol. It's what you do when there are such grave misgivings in a case. Obviously, this is because there are a lot of concerns about how the initial investigations into the four men's deaths were handled. And they actually ended up investigating 17 officers because there was alleged misconduct. The actual investigation was lengthy. And after that lengthy investigation and those 17 individuals being looked at for possible misconduct, none received any disciplinary action. None. So let's just run through that a minute. So the Mets asked the Independent Police Commission to investigate whether they'd done anything wrong, because obviously they'd done a lot wrong. And of the 17 individuals who were investigated, apparently they'd all done it right and there was nothing to see here. Ludicrous. This is why systems are broken. Because even when it's blindingly obvious that every man and his dog essentially thought that what was going on in the Stephen Port case was horrific, no one was brought to justice for it. And if no one takes responsibility and accountability for these kind of misgivings and failings, nothing changes. Now, obviously, when it came down to Port, he denied the charges of murder. He pled not guilty to all four counts, which is likely to do with the fact that in his mind, he's thinking, well, they can't prove I murdered them. Even if they get to prove that I'm involved, I'll just say that all of these individuals took the drugs and voluntarily killed themselves by mistake, so to speak. And I had nothing to do with that apart from being present. And yes, I was scared. And yes, I was unlucky, but I definitely wasn't a murderer. But there was a lot of evidence against Port. So number one, just on a causation level, you look at the chain of causation leading to the deaths. Four of the men all spent their last moments with him before dying. Also, you know that suicide note that 
the father of Daniel had said might not be his writing. Well, the reason it might not be his writing was because it was Stephen Port's writing and the handwriting expert confirmed that beyond any doubt whatsoever it was. And the notepad it was written on was even found in Stephen Port's flat. When Stephen Port found out that they'd recognised that beyond doubt he had written the actual suicide note, not Daniel, he suddenly remembered that, oh yeah, yeah, no, okay. So yeah, I did, actually, I did. I wrote the note, but it was Daniel who dictated the note to me. So I was just being a smart little helper, nice little guy, writing the note out for him. So your excuse is that you specifically helped to write out a suicide note for an individual who was found dead. Yes, I wrote it for him. But you didn't think about intervening in any way, shape or form to prevent somebody taking their own life. Now you're throwing that in. I'd not thought further than just saying it wasn't me. It does make me look like a bit of a dick. It makes you look like somebody who's quite happy for people to die. I do see where you're going with this. Yeah, I'm saying you're a massive murderer and you haven't thought this one through. I'm not guilty and I'm just very good at helping people write the notes they dictate. I kid you not. You know that wet kipper that I think you should be able to slap suspects around the face with? I want a tuna in this case because tunas are massive. I don't know whether any of you have had any contact or connection or understanding in your life of what tunas can be like. And I don't eat any fish or meat, but I'm saying, if you were to get smacked around the chops by a big tuna, well, you wouldn't be in the room you were smacked in. That's how big they are. But you know what I mean? Suddenly he's just written the note on behalf of Daniel and it had the notes dictated to him. And another incriminating issue was the sunglasses that Gabriel was found wearing because that contained Port's DNA. The jacket Daniel was wearing also contained DNA from Port. And bear in mind that Port said that he'd never met or had sex with Jack Taylor because he was arguing, and you'll see it in an interview with him, where he says that he chooses younger looking boys and that Jack looked older. But then at trial, he actually said that Jack had been in his flat and that he had given himself drugs whilst he was there and that allegedly the two had parted ways and then Jack must have conveniently died, not in his flat, but elsewhere. And, and I mean, they, that's Jack Taylor, so you don't recognise no, Jack Taylor? No. So have you ever slept with this male? No. Had sexual intercourse with him? It doesn't look like the type I'd go with myself. He's not the sort of person you'd go for? No, I tend to war. It's more younger, drink it boys, more, you know, more younger boys, but not, uh, he looks older. It's laughable, but nonetheless, it just denotes how little accountability and responsibility Port is taking for the crimes he's committed. Another incriminating factor is that Stephen's own sister, she actually spoke to him on the phone on August 26, and he literally told her that there was a body of a young man in his flat. So that's going to be a little bit disturbing, isn't it? I mean, call my siblings quite a lot. If they were to tell me there was a body of a young man in their house, well, there'd be police in their house pretty quickly afterwards. I wouldn't be like, Hang on, bro. Hang on, sis. I'll be there with the pigs, the spades and the lime. Just don't do anything without me. You know, arguably, you should be on the phone to the police at that moment in time. But nonetheless, maybe she didn't believe that he'd actually done anything. Maybe she just wanted to pretend that hadn't occurred. But it's deeply incriminating when that comes out. Now, when it came down to the trial of this case, Mr Justice Openshaw said that only Stephen Port knows exactly what happened in the case of each murder. But... It's believed that Stephen Port drugged his victims with an overdose of GHB. Then he had sex with them whilst they were unconscious. And the judge was absolutely certain that Anthony Wargate was already dead when Stephen went to work on that late shift before calling 999 at 4 a.m. He believes that in Anthony's case, Stephen Port dragged his body into the street by his flat. It's also believed that Stephen Port in each case carried Gabriel, Daniel and Jack to the churchyard, then positioned their bodies, planted the bottles of GHB and then disposed of their mobile phones. 
it's not exactly known how Stephen moved the bodies because, of course, he denies doing it. But Stephen Port was an athletic guy. He went to the gym and he's six foot five. So he was a big unit. And that would have meant that for these young, quite slight guys, he would have been able to carry them. And one of the theories that they had about how he transported the bodies was that he wrapped them in bed sheets to transport them. So carrying them, quote, as if you're carrying a child to bed. That was what was noted in court. Now, police, when they were doing their investigations, obviously spoke to young men in the area who may have been affected by Stephen Paul, and they found six living victims who actually didn't want to take part in the prosecution. You have to remember that being in a public courtroom, it feels very, very intimidating. And if you have a particular lifestyle, such as you enjoy having orgies and taking part in sex parties under chemsex situations, you might be a lawyer, you might be a police officer yourself, you might be a teacher. The idea of going into a situation where there's a public gallery and actually discussing what happened to you is going to be challenging for you, not because you don't deserve to have what happened to you represented, but because of the consequences and the ramifications of actually stating that information where other people will have that knowledge about you. So I fully understand that for many people who have been victims of Stephen Port, they won't want to go and talk about it. But there were another eight additional men who did come forward to report drugging and sexual assaults that Stephen Port had carried out against them. Now, fortunately, when it came down to the case itself, the identities were actually kept anonymous. They were just referred to as victims A to H. So victim A, they were a university student who was 19 at the time. So he met Stephen Port in 2012 through Grinder, went to his flat. He was given red wine. But after he drank it, immediately realised it had been spiked because he saw powder at the bottom of the glass. And then Stephen dragged him to the bedroom and raped him. He was really disorientated, couldn't fight this big guy off. And he actually went and sought medical advice after the attack, which is just horrifying. Victim B, he was 20 at the time when he met Stephen in 2014. He was given a non-alcoholic drink by Stephen, which literally knocked him out. And when he woke up, he shouted for help because he had literally no control of his body. And Stephen Port took him to the station at Barking. And at this point, he was vomiting a green liquid. And the victim was unable to determine whether he'd been raped by Stephen. But I think we can all agree it's highly likely. Victim C was known to Stephen Port. And they had actually had consensual sex in the past. But he knows that during some of these circumstances and situations, he was definitely unconscious. Victim D, he was 22 years of age at the time, and he was actually described by Justice Openshaw as being acutely vulnerable. This was because at the time that he met, he was actually undergoing gender reassignment, and he'd also suffered from a head injury and an assault, and he was suffering some very long-term consequences. In 2015, Port knocked him unconscious by spiking his drink, didn't just rape him, but filmed him doing so and then to add insult to injury to this victim he even made that victim watch the footage the next day victim e that was a 35 year old in july of 2015 he met stephen port on grinder he actually did consent to anal sex with stephen but stephen in spite of this consensually being allowed to have sex with him didn't feel that was enough so he gave him drugs anally with the guys that he was applying lubricant and victim E actually realised what had happened and then left Stephen's home. Victim F, he again met Stephen Port on Grinder. that was in 2015. Like with victim E, Stephen gave him drugs anally despite the fact that he made it clear to him he didn't take drugs and Stephen then had sex with him whilst he was really dizzy, whilst he was in shock and then he actually became unconscious. Then we have victim G, Again, he was known to Stephen Port, but they had kind of lost contact, but they did make contact again through Grinder in September 2015. Again, Stephen Port surreptitiously applied drugs anally, and then the victim felt really drunk and really dizzy, but fortunately managed to leave. Victim H, again, known to Stephen Port, he was 24 years of age in October 2015, and he'd actually fallen on some really hard times. He'd lost a relationship and he was actually dealing with homelessness and alcoholism. So really vulnerable situation. So he ends up staying with Stephen for a 
couple of weekends. Whilst he's living with Stephen Paul, he felt really pressured into snorting a few lines of drugs, but he was also given drugs anally without his knowledge. He became unconscious and he knew that Stephen Paul had had sex with him. So what's really interesting is you'll note that most of his victims, they had actually consented to have sex with him. So the very fact that they were willing to have sex with him demonstrates that Stephen Port was not interested in the sex. He was interested in rendering them unconscious to then use them as he wished to use them. It was about raping them. He didn't want consensual sex. I didn't get him. I didn't turn him on. I didn't give him his kicks. He needed them totally helpless. He needed to play out his dark fantasies into actuality in spite of the fact that he could have had willing partners, wasn't a willing partner he wanted. He lured them there on that false pretense. He wanted to use and abuse them after rendering them unconscious, after drugging them, to a degree that, as we know, could have killed them. And again, that's why I come back down on this level of believing this is a violent, sexual, serial killer, sadist, predator, murderer, genuinely. I don't just think this is a guy who ever just intended to rape these men. I think that killing was also part of his toolkit. I think he didn't want to kill all of them. He could get his kicks most of the time from rendering them unconscious and raping them. But I think that occasionally he liked having that complete domination over their bodies and ultimately snuffing out their very lives. You won't be surprised to find out that Stephen Port was found guilty of murdering the four men and he was also rightfully convicted of drugging or sexually assaulting an additional seven men. So in total, he was convicted with 22 offences against 11 men, four counts of murder, four counts of rape, though he was actually cleared of three counts of rape. I don't know why they bothered clearing him of those three counts of rape. I just think with all of the information I've given you today, he's guilty as hell of whatever those people say. This man is deviant and dangerous beyond belief, but that's what happened. He also got charged and found guilty of 10 counts of administering a substance and four counts of sexual assault. So the sentencing of Stephen Port happened on the 25th of November, 2016, and Mr. Justice Openshaw and me do not agree. I'm going to just put it out there. I don't agree with this summing up where this particular judge is concerned. I do agree with his sentencing, but I just have a difference of opinion when it comes to the viewpoint he has about Port. So this is what Mr. Justice Openshaw said. He said, I accept his intention was only to cause really serious harm rather than cause death, but he must have known and foreseen there was a high risk of death, the more so after the death of Anthony Wargate the first victim. No. I don't know how you guys feel, but no. I think the judge has got it wrong. If you are drugging somebody and you happen to kill them, that should be enough to stop you ever drugging anyone again. If you then drug another person and they die and you don't change your behaviour, in fact, you carry on down that road and you kill another too, there is absolutely no way that you were not considering that they may well die and that you'd not considered how that would impact on you. He knows he doesn't care. If they die, if I kill them, that's fine. And we're talking about a sexual sadist of a high level here. There is nothing more alluring, captivating. There is nothing more fueling than knowing that you have the ultimate power seeing the impact of your destruction. I absolutely believe that Stephen Port had been a sexual sadist and a rapist for a very long time. But I also believe he had graduated and he had become a relentless serial killer who would have continued to kill again and again and again. Now, despite the judge acknowledging that he didn't actually believe Stephen's intention was to kill, and like I said, I disagree with him on that part, we do agree on what he said next. He said, the seriousness 
of the offending is so exceptionally high that a whole life order is justified. Indeed, it is required. So, amen to that. No matter what me and the judge disagree on, when it comes down to the sentencing, we are both on the same page. Never going to walk the streets again, sweetheart. You will never get the option to kill again. Stephen Port received a life in prison with no minimum term. So he's going to die in prison. And that is a very good thing, full stop. Now, understandably, police failings. Let's just look at them. So in December 2021, there was actually an inquest to the death of Anthony, Gabriel, Daniel and Jack. And it was ruled that fundamental failings by the Metropolitan Police probably contributed to three of the four deaths. Sorry, I'm all on board with this about the failings. Can we get rid of the word probably? Many of you will have never been to a coroner's inquest. Honestly, personally, in my experience, it felt a little bit like a kangaroo court in the fact that it's just, what do we want the result to be? Okay, let's do that. Even when they have things in front of them that you know on one level when they're reading out what they believe to be the verdict, actually they know fundamentally to be untrue. But that's my personal experience. Unfortunately, I have been in circumstances where I've had to attend and where the result has been awful for the family. But nonetheless, putting the word probably contributed to three of the four deaths is an insult to every single family member affected in this case. It's absolutely awful that friends and sisters of victims were doing more to connect the dots than the actual authorities. But that's what they said. It was ruled that the fundamental failings by the Metropolitan Police probably contribute, just probably, not actually, not did, not obviously did, just probably. The families of the victims all believe that homophobia played a role in the reluctance to take the cases of the deaths of the four young men more seriously, and I can completely understand that. Jack Taylor's family actually released a statement through their solicitor saying the inquest identified fundamental failings and basic errors in the investigation into Anthony's death, which meant that Port was free to go on to kill Gabriel, Daniel and Jack. And absolutely, 100%, that's true. They then went on to say Port was jailed for life, but the police have blood on their hands too. It is time for them to be held accountable. I can hear the rage in that statement and I would feel rageful too. The Stephen Port case was described as a calamitous litany of failures from which the Metropolitan Police has reportedly still not learned from. The inspector of the constabulary, Matt Parr, said that it's very difficult to explain how such obvious murders, linked murders, were completely missed at the time and that the risk of something similar happening again has to be minimised. I mean, yes, it does have to be minimised, i.e. the chance for this to happen again should be eradicated completely. It's unbelievable how something so sinister could happen time and time again because the police didn't do their work. In April 2023, a watchdog report found that the risk of homicides not being identified by the police is way higher than it should be, which isn't the most reassuring situation, is it? It's not very reassuring that murders aren't being identified as murdered by the police at a level that shouldn't be occurring. That's terrifying. Some officers were even heard saying that they relied on luck to find links between deaths. You don't need luck, love. You had little bottles of GHB, bodies propped in the same scenario with clothes that had clearly been placed on them, all connected to a local area. That's not luck. That's just the most obvious connection ever. But because of that, it's been said that history could repeat itself if improvement doesn't occur. And that's really concerning, isn't it? Considering that this is being said at a time a decade after the murders were carried out by Stephen Port. And still, the fear is that these failings could occur again and again and again. And I genuinely do 
understand the frustration and upset of the families who have lost their loved ones to Stephen Port because they feel that the police looked at these gay young men and judged them totally inappropriately. Their expectation that young gay men are having lots of throwaway sex, taking lots of drugs, living a more risky lifestyle, clouded their actual investigative capabilities and capacities. Every human being has a story. We agree and disagree with certain elements of all the people that we love's lives that they lead, but every single one of them is worth everything. And each of those individuals' lives should have been taken as a priority to investigate and make sure that no stone was left unturned to investigate what had happened to that person, no matter where they came from, what their sexuality was, what they enjoyed doing in their past time. None of that should have meant that they were literally seen as accidental overdoses, when clearly it was obvious to everybody, including random dog water, that that simply wasn't the case. They had port at the very beginning of this. And because of those failures, he got to kill again and again and again. It's absolutely harrowing. I hope you found today's case interesting. Obviously, it's never enjoyable. If you've watched cases on this before, I hope that you actually have taken something more from watching my content. I always hate repeating information that you already know. I hope that you've got some added value from listening. If you know anything more about this case, please let me know. If you've been affected by similar circumstances where you have met the authorities with their stereotypes about you and it's led to yourselves finding it very challenging to get justice, let me know in the comments. I always read them and I love to hear from you. As ever, guys, I will see you again next time. Wednesdays, Sundays, always. Crime and Consistency is my nickname. It's not actually my nickname because that would be too long. But as ever, see you soon and be safe.